Welcome to the Miracle Project. My name is Philip Gatta. I am uh, the principal investigator of the Miracle Project together with Hans Florian Zeilhofer that you have uh, already seen before. As you know, here in Basel, we have been working on cutting bones with laser for many, many years. And we already have the uh, first spin off company created in 2010 that you have just seen, AOT, which is also working on the problem of cutting bones with laser. However, in 2014, we got from the Werner Siemens Foundation a 15 million grant where we can work on the miniaturization of, uh, of robots that are cutting bones with laser. And this is what the Miracle Project is uh, all about. This Miracle Project consists of four individual groups. The first one is the Planning and Navigation Group. Uh, then we have a Laser Physics Group, who is more working on what is the best laser to cut bones, how can we measure the depth of the cut, how can we characterize the tissue inside the bone, how can we characterize the tumor that we are currently cutting, potentially cutting with the laser. We have a robotics group who is dealing with the robotic structure uh, that we have, so is creating this flexible uh, endoscopic uh, endoscopic robot and then as the fourth group we also have a smart implants group who is working on how can we miniaturize implants such that we can bring them into the body how can we assemble them inside the body what are the best implants that we can replace the bone with uh, that we have cut as so we will now start our round through the miracle project and uh, the first one uh, that we will visit is the planning and navigation group which is my group my group is basically split in two parts. I have a planning uh, part in my group because in the Miracle Project we are not only looking at the robot and how we can cut the bones most efficiently, but we look at the entire chain from the planning of an intervention until an intervention has been uh, done and performed by the robot. We look at every stage and if we are not happy with one of the or with the state of the art of one of these stages, we have a PhD student uh, working on it. And this is why I have a, a VR group which is working on the planning aspects, but I also have a group which is working on novel sensors, and this is one of these uh, novel sensors. It's a quite a tiny uh, rotary uh, encoder which has uh, unprecedented accuracy, which we will, uh, which we plan on using than in our endoscopic robot. But we are also working on fiber shape sensing and this is the next uh, project I would like to present you now. If I ask you, please follow me. Okay, this is now the lab of uh, Samani, who is working on the fiber shape sensing. So basically the idea is that we have a, a single um, tiny fiber that we can use, for example, in uh, articulated robots, like continuum robots, to sense their shape. And Samani will now explain you on how she performed, performs this magic. Samani. Yeah. Hello, welcome to Fiber Optic Lab. As Philip already mentioned, we are developing a new um, fiber-based tracking system to provide real-time uh, feedback on shape and the position of the robotic endoscope in the Merkel project. Um, as you can see here, um, we are working on the edge FPGs that are basically uh, fiber bright gratings inscribed on the edge of the fiber's core. Uh, designed by Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute in Germany. And this gives us the advantage of uh, reading amplitude of the gratings because the amplitude is actually carrying the strain information and not the wavelengths like the normal uh, FPG sensors. Um, so what is difficult about this sort of sensors is that uh, this structure is also sensitive to st um, the change of the spectrum profile that can be caused by undesired uh, bending related phenomena. Unfortunately, the uh, existing track and uh, the existing theories cannot uh, 
um, accurately predict how the spectrum profile changes in the curved optical fiber and um, therefore a new technique needs to be developed in order to take into account these sort of changes that may cause uh, inaccuracy in shape prediction. Um, so what we did in our lab is that we designed um, a new technique in order to model these sensors. Uh, we trained a deep neural network in order to directly um, predict the shape, the actual shape of the sensor based on the full spectrum of the edge FPGs. Um, so we basically used um, a simple and low-cost interrogation system to measure the spectrum of uh, the edge FPG sensor and we used a motion capture system, uh, contains five uh, cameras uh, in order to monitor the actual shape of, uh, of the sensor. So we have uh, reflective markers attached to the tube that is protecting the fiber sensor. So something like this is inside the tube. We have the base of the sensor fixed and uh, we basically move around uh, the, the, the fiber in random uh, curvatures and uh, orientations in order to, to collect some, some training samples. Um, so the design model can actually predict um, uh, the, the shape of a 30 centimeter long fiber with um, average tip error of less than 6 millimeter, and which is already um, quite promising, but for further improvement we will uh, basically define a, a constraint environment uh, for manipulating the shape. Uh, and we will automate uh, the data collection process to make sure that um, both training and testing samples are actually corresponding to the same workspace. Thank you. Okay, now that you have seen on uh, how we want to capture uh, the position exactly of this uh, flexible continuum robot inside the body, we can now go outside to the virtual reality guys uh, that will shortly introduce you on what we developed for planning uh, the surgical interventions in virtual reality. Okay, now we are in the virtual reality room where uh, Balash will explain you on what we do for improving the planning stage and for this we will join him in the virtual reality room. So Balash, explain us. Okay, so here you can see uh, the CT and MR visualization system for VR that we are working on. And normally, um, doctors use uh, such cross sections of the of a CT scan, and then they can slice through the scan like this. But you need a lot of experience and knowledge about uh, how these scans work and about the anatomy to to uh, recognize the different tissues. So it's much easier if we can turn on a 3D visualization uh, like the one that you can see here. And then we can look at it from any angle. We can scale it up or down. Whoa, impressive. And we are working on uh, surgical planning tools. So for instance, you can uh, also do measurements. So you can measure different parts of the scan or you can draw into it, for instance, to highlight some parts that are relevant to some surgery. Or we can uh, also remove parts of the scan that you can see, for instance, into the skull. Okay, and I think now we can show the same uh, in augmented reality as well. Thanks a lot, Balash. Uh, So here, wearing, uh, I'm wearing augmented reality glasses and we can provide the same functionalities uh, as in VR, but using augmented reality. So not restricting the user inside uh, this virtual space, not blocking his view. I can see still everyone inside this room, plus the virtual projection that we have uh, here. And the advantage of this is that we can actually use it in the operating room. Once we make the plans in VR, we can then move this to augmented reality. Uh, and to the operating room. And uh, all the functionalities that we know from VR are also available in AR.
Okay, with this we will uh, shortly conclude uh, what, the, what this planning and navigation group is doing in the Miracle project and we will go over uh, to the robotics group where Georg Rauter will explain you um, the robots that he's uh, building in the Miracle project. Hi everybody, my name is Georg Rauter. I'm, I'm professor for medical robotics and mechatronics at the Department for Biomedical Engineering at the University of Basel. And within the Miracle project, we develop uh, bigger robots that we combine with industrial components in order to form a bigger robotic platforms. We are also developing robotic flexible endoscopes that we put uh, then at the end of the uh, robotic platforms and within uh, the Miracle Project actually we will implement then laser fibers and sensors in order to uh, enable precise positioning of the laser cuts in the patients. And uh, in order to allow um, positioning the global system uh, on the patient we now go to the lab where we see the bigger robot uh, and my team working on this bigger robot and how we assure uh, usability in this system. Please just follow him. Okay, so welcome to the robotics lab where you see a KUKA LBR IBA mounted on a linear stage. So this is uh, our robotic setup that will allow positioning of a robotic endoscopes on a larger scale and uh, here the idea is that we have very intuitive interaction between the user which would be the surgeon and the robotic device and uh, also uh, to allow a simple visualization of the workspace so here you see our team with Morali, Marek and Nicola and uh, Morali will explain you in detail how this system exactly works. Thank you. So here uh, we have the industrial hardware which has been extended to perform better for medical scenarios. The robot here, which is from KUKA, has been extended with a linear rail to have a large workspace. For example, the robot can reach from the leg and reach the head of the person. This could be useful in, for example, the maxillofacial surgeries. Beyond the development of the hardware, which is safe and industry standard, we also work on the software of the robot where the users can control the robot easily and intuitively. For example, we have the teleoperative systems, which are the standard for surgical instruments, but we also have additionally hands-on interfaces. Here you can see a custom handle which has been developed in the lab that allows the surgeon to grab the handle and move the robot as he wants. The handle measures the forces that have been applied by the user and moves in accordance to it. This makes the control of such a robot easy and transparent. This is useful in uh, the initial setup of the robot, for example, when the tool has been mounted and bring it to the patient. We also have a collaboration with Sian here. You can see Marek wearing the VR glasses and the robot is visualized simultaneously in the virtual environment. As I move the robot, it updates simultaneously in the virtual environment and the user gets a feedback what the robot is doing. This can be used for planning purposes where the surgeon can use tools like this to draw paths that the robot has to perform and is visualized to the user so that he can decide which is better or which is not good. So on the whole, we work on hardware and software development of the robot, which makes it intuitive for surgery and getting closer to the operation theaters. Thank you. You have seen uh, how this robotic platform works and how the uh, user, so the surgeon can use it. Now we look at the second component. So here you see a dummy endoscope and here I have uh, a prototype of a robotic uh, endoscope. And the idea is uh, now to show you how these endoscopes are developed and therefore we go to the other lab where you see much more robotic components. So welcome to our second robotics lab where you see more about the robotic endoscopes. 
and many other devices that are in collaboration with the Miracle Project and Surgical Robotics. So the first project will be presented by our PhD student Lorin, who is developing um, series elastic endoscopes. Okay, thank you, Georg, and hello, everybody. Um, so, what I'm doing in my PhD project is to um, to try to improve uh, robotic endoscopes. Um, and one approach that we're taking is to to make a uh, robotic endoscope safer. Um, the way that we are going is to actually integrate springs into the transmission um, of these, these robotic endoscopes. Normally what you have um, is you have uh, tendons that run from the, the motors all the way to the movable tip of the endoscopes and they're usually uh, tightened pretty, uh, pretty stiff. And so what, what can happen is if, uh, for example, the surgeon doesn't see what's happening outside the the field of view of this endoscope, um, it can come in, come in contact with, uh, with uh, sensitive tissue and if he doesn't see that then uh, he might damage it. So integrating these springs um, brings some kind of, of um, compliance uh, to the mechanism so you don't have that, that impact anymore. Um, and another good thing is uh, that you can actually measure the deflection of these springs and with that um, you get an idea of what the torque is of, uh, of the endoscope uh, joint. And I can show you here um, what that can be used for. So for example, if the, if the endoscope is moving um, and if it touches um, some kind of tissue, then it doesn't necessarily move uh, to keep uh, the, the, this point of view in, in focus but it actually, we can limit the, the torque which it's, uh, is applied to this, to this endoscope joint, uh, which makes it safer. Um, so this can be used in, in tele-operated um, uh, surgery, um, as you know it from the Da Vinci maybe, um, but it can also be used in, in autonomous, or at least partly autonomous uh, control. Uh, so for example, here in the, in the tip of this endoscope, we have, um, a miniature camera which is integrated um, and you, you see that that image here um, you see my, my finger maybe um, and what we're trying to do here is keep um, this black dot in the center of the image um, so if I move the, the endoscope uh, to the right um, or if, if I move the black dot to the to the right, uh, um, the endoscope will follow. You can also see that here on the visualization on this GUI um, that we programmed. And also here you can see if, if now it comes into contact uh, with surrounding tissue, you see that red bar appearing here. Uh, this, this means that we have some, um, some, some contact force um, and, and it stops uh, from moving. Um, so what can we now use this, this autonomous control for? Um, we can see that over here, that's a, a, a demonstration um, object that we, that we built. Um, you see uh, there's some kind of anatomy here um, that's supposed to, to represent um, a beating heart. Uh, you see that there's, um, I hope you can see it through the, through the rib cage, uh, that there's a, a black dot um, attached to, to this heart. Um, and there's also a miniature camera in the, in the tip of this, of this endoscope. Um, and if I move this heart now, it follows um, the, the, uh, the black dot and tries to keep it in the center of the image. Uh, so that can be used to compensate for, for anatomy uh, or, or movement of the, of the patient anatomy. Um, of course, there's always the possibility uh, for the surgeon to intervene uh, we have that here with this with this haptic um, input device. Um, if the surgeon doesn't like what the what the endoscope is doing, he can always um, take over the control um, and do that manually. And with that, um, I give over to to Nikki, uh, which is also concerned with uh, input devices. So for haptic input devices, you have already seen a three-dimensional example. We also have a bit more complicated prototypes from company um, that we bought. It's a six degree of freedom lambda. Uh, it has six degree of freedom kinematic input and provides six degree of freedom force and torque feedback. So that means compared to a uh, normal tele manipulation console, here 
the surgeon or user can also receive force feedback. So in the case of Lorentz endoscope, if it touches something and recognizes a force, we can display this force to the user. What we can also do with such a setup is in collaboration with our team from the planning and navigation group, here you see Balash again, using the system in simulation. So he is now palpating a four vertebra of which we took a CT image. So this nicely illustrates the capabilities that we have, that we can take patient data and directly do visual haptic volume rendering. That means we can directly take the data set and similar to the approach that they have developed for visual rendering, we can do haptic rendering without creating polygon meshes. So this would allow a direct workflow where surgeons could directly inspect custom patient data both visually and haptically. With this, I would like to give over and hand back to our head of the lab, Georg. Thanks Nikolai and Balas for explaining also our visual haptic setup for surgical training and simulation. Now I'd like to uh, show you the last project that we'd like to uh, show today from my lab, which is uh, Manuela. uh, Manuela's project. Uh, she's working on the endoscope for Miracle, which integrates all the components together, uh, and finally also having the uh, laser fiber in there. So please, Manuela, explain uh, more about your uh, work. Please come closer. What you can see here is the robotic device that we developed for minimal invasive cutting of bone using a laser. It consists of three, three separate robotic devices. First, we have here a bigger macro robotic device that you already saw before. It helps the surgeon to hold and guide the whole instrument in the operation room. And then on top of this robotic device, we have what we call an actuation pack. This device is basically the muscle for the instruments at the tip. It holds the motors for moving tendons that control the robotic endoscope and also sensors for sensing and control of the device. Further at the tip, we have the actual robotic endoscope here. This device works similar as a finger. It has discrete joints that move in one direction. And at the tip of this robotic endoscope, we have the third robot. It's a miniature parallel robot. You can see this here, these golden arms. We have four of them. It's a four bar linkage mechanism. And if we turn it around, you can also see it has two legs here and here that attach to the bone. Once attached, the robot can move the laser very accurately to cut the bone below. And the laser comes into the robot via an optical fiber. And this fiber you can see here in yellow, it goes through the entire device here to the back and then is connected to the laser source. And about the laser source, we will hear more in the next lab. Thanks a lot, Manuela, for your explanations on our miracle uh, device. So now you know how we can assure um, uh, safety and accuracy by our robotic devices. Now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Asa Zam, who is uh, head of the laser lab and will show you which lasers he is developing and how he is using lasers in order to develop uh, smart sensors. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Azar Zam. I'm currently a professor in medical laser physics and optics at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Basel. So today I would like to uh, take you to uh, visit my lab uh, 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 where we're going to see about what we do in the medical project. So let's follow me. Hi, welcome to my lab. So uh, my lab is called uh, Biomedical Laser and Optics Group. So in BLOCK we are working in developing optical technology and laser technology for biomedical applications. 
in particularly for medical projects, we are developing a miniaturized laser system and also miniaturized optical sensors for uh, developing a minimally invasive laser osteotomy. So first, I would like you to see some highlights that we have in our lab, which is related with the medical projects. So the first project, I will give it to my uh, recent graduate, Dr. Lena, Lena Bertral, uh, where she will explain about the miniaturization of the laser surgery system. Lena, I'll Hello. give it to you. Uh, here I show you the setup for ablation. So this is our main laser, Erbiumiac laser. Uh, the laser uh, is coming here, this is the output, and then it goes, it does this part here. Here it's combined with our visible laser to have visualization of our part. And then we have the beam coming here, and this is our coupling setup. So we have a fiber here that is uh, capable of uh, withstanding the energy of this laser, which is very high, up to 3 joules. And uh, here we have the ablation setup. So this is a sample of bone, and we have some uh, small lenses to be focused on the on the surface of the bone. So now uh, we would like to show you a little bit of uh, cutting of the bone with the laser. So we should we should all use our goggles to protect our eyes. And. that we just made is like this so now uh, we continue to the feedback system so I will introduce you to my colleague so he's Arjun and he will explain you some. hello everyone as my colleague already explained we can use a laser for cutting the bone but to use a laser in medical application we need some feedback in the Miracle Project, we are going to cut the bone with the laser. But to do this, we need to know the type of a tissue and in the real time, the depth of the cut that we are cutting. Here, I will show you the combined setup, the laser ablation with two feedback systems, which I will introduce. The first part is the Erbilmec laser that cutting the bone. The laser comes in this direction and focus on the sound. In the same time, we are using the optical coherence tomography system, which is the three-dimensional imaging system that can provide the depth of the cut in the real time. So whenever we reach the desired depth, we can stop the ablation laser. Also, to know the type of a tissue, we are using the lip system. This is a lip system that coming and combined with these two systems, and in the same ablation spot, we can find the type of a tissue. So if it was the bone, the erbium like laser can cut the bone. If it was the muscle or bone marrow, it should stop. By analyzing this generated plasma with the lip system, we can connect, connect the generated plasma to here, then it goes to the spectrometer, and we can find out the type of a tissue. So when we are shooting the bone, we will have some calcium, we can find, okay, this is a bone and we should cut. And when we are uh, generated plasma on the muscle or bone marrow, we should stop the ablation laser. Here is the software. This is the OCT part, the cross-sectional image of the sample. And here we can see the depth of the cut. So whenever we reach the desired depth, we can stop the ablation laser. And this part showing the lip system, when the generated plasma shows that it's a soft tissue, it should be red. Whenever it's a hard tissue, means bone, it should be green. And the early laser is allowed to cut the sample. Now I would like to start the setup and show you some 
ablation and real-time feedback system. As you saw, with this system, we can perform a smart laser osteotomy, cutting the bone in the same time, knowing the type of the tissue and the depth of the cut in the real time. The next step will be the miniaturizing this setup, and my colleague Ferda will explain more about this. So, hello everyone. Now I will be showing you the miniaturized version of the tissue differentiation system that my colleague already explained. Uh, on the, on the sample that he had, you were seeing this plasma formation on the soft, bone, soft uh, tissue and bone, bone tissue. Now we have only bone here and I will show you the miniaturized part. So the beam was directed over there, so I'm changing the direction now. Laser output is coming from here and it's combined with the green laser just to gain some visibility. And we continue to this mirror. To, have, uh, to be able to align it properly and we have a focusing optic and a beam profiler in between. This beam profiler helps us to shape the beam uh, to have an equal intensity distribution all over the beam uh, surface and then it's sent to the fiber and the fiber bundle is coming into here. Here we have a fiber bundle which is uh, which is made of combined many fibers to be able to handle higher energy. So now, at the end tip, you will see a half hole lens which is collecting the beams to the to the bone sample. And on the bone, we need, we will see some plasma formation already. And now we can start the laser. And here, here you saw the miniaturized version of the tissue differentiation system. And as you see, the working distances are really short and the fiber tip and the uh, optics are really small. This part will be going into the endoscope to be able to differentiate the tissue in the end. Now I can hand it over to Professor Zonda. Okay. Yeah, we have shown some of the highlights of the technology that we are developing for the medical projects. So thank you very much for your visit. Now I will now we go to the uh, University of Hospital to visit uh, the group of Florian Teringer, where he will he, he will explain about the smart implant that he's developing for the uh, medical project. Welcome to the University Hospital of Basel. My name is Florian Thieringer. I'm the co-director of the 3D Print Lab located here at the University Hospital campus. And I'm the head of the Swiss MIM Research Group as a part of the Miracle Research Group or the Miracle Project and the Smart Implants Group. What we do here is bringing the technology to the patient. We produce, we plan and produce patient-specific implants. We do a lot of research in the area of computer-assisted surgery as well as medical 3D printing, medical additive manufacturing. Printing patient models, printing patient-specific implants made out of different materials up to biomaterials and biological implants that are being developed at the moment together with different research groups here at the University Hospital and on the campus in Alschwil. And now I would like you to follow me to our first station in our design lab. Welcome in the 3D planning lab. Actually, we are here now in the area where the 
patient-specific implants are being designed, planned. We do research in finite element analysis, in topology optimization, in designing new implants to treat our patients, patient specifically, so manufactured to the need and to the shape of the anatomy, really high performance implants will be designed. And I would like to introduce you to Michaela Mainz. She's a PhD student here in our research group and she will explain what she's doing here. Hello, my name is Michaela. I'm a PhD student in the Smart Implants group at the Department of Biomedical Engineering. I'm, uh, my topic is about patient-specific implants and uh, 3D printing of these implants. And I actually am concerned with also optimizing these designs using computational tools. And I would actually like to show you um, an example of a patient that we have. Uh, when we plan an implant, we start off with the CT images, which you can see here. Uh, you see here the CT images. And these CT images we can um, extract information from. Um, here we can see the a bone model, which was segmented. And uh, we can uh, separate um, the teeth from the bone here, for example. And uh, when we need an implant here. In this case, we have a patient with uh, with a large cyst, uh, which had to be extracted, and we need an implant to stabilize this corner region. We talk to the surgeons and determine where we can place the screws. And when we have the screw location, which you can see here, we can also generate an implant. Design this implant here. So uh, when we have this implant design. We can go over and also uh, look at the design using computational tools such as finite element analysis, which you can see on the screen to the right, uh, where you can see uh, the stress distribution in the implant, also in the bone, and also in the screws, uh, which, which can be a good tool before you do any biomechanical testing. And uh, when we have this implant design, we um, send it to the University of Applied Sciences Northwestern Switzerland, who have a certified workflow to produce these implants out of titanium. And I actually want, would like to show you a, a patient model here. So we printed uh, in our print lab this um, mandible, and we can look at the fit of a titanium implant on the bone and see how well it fits. Yes, um, so this was uh, my topic. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> See you. So now from the planning lab, we will switch to, to new projects or to different projects in our research center to Schweischwey um, in the DBE in Alschwil and to NEA at the University Hospital of Basel in the operating theater. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 3D bioprinting section. This is an extrusion based bioprinter. You can print a scaffold with living cells. Um, to print uh, the scaffold, we prepare our own bio ink. This is a um, bio ink for, for bone tissue regeneration, and this is a bio ink for cartilage regeneration. And to print a scaffold, we need to design a we need to design our object. We import the file, a uh, customized file to the software. Then we slice it. We get the printing parameters and everything we transfer it to the file printer. This is a temperature controlling system which can control the printing temperature during the printing process. Here, this is a print head. Here, it's a print bed. You can see the printing process here. As you can see, as you can see, here is a scaffold. It's an elastic scaffold. Can be used for cartilage regeneration. 
thank you for your attention and next one will be my colleague Neha Sharma. She will introduce a little bit about in-house 3D printing for patient-specific implants. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Neha Sharma and in this segment I will talk about point-of-care manufacturing of patient-specific implants. As you can see we are into the OR and the idea of this project is to print implants in-house in close proximity to the operating room and also to the sterilization room. On my back side, you can see a 3D printer which can print patient-specific implants made out of peak. Now the working principle of this printer is similar to the FDM printers that we have. So we have a filament which melts at a 100, uh, 400 degrees Celsius and prints the implant in a layer by layer fashion. As you can see, this is a skull model in which there is a huge defect and this is a test implant that we printed and the idea is to reconstruct and fit the implant as precisely to the defect. So that was for this segment. Thank you for your attention and now I will pass it on to my boss, Florian Thieringer. So now we have already seen two different applications of 3D printing in um, biomedical engineering with focus on regenerative surgery. And uh, now we're discussing the different applications of 3D printing at the point of care. And I would like to introduce uh, to you Hans Florian Zeilhofer. Professor Zeilhofer is the former chairman of maxillofacial surgery in Basel and I think he's one of the pioneers in medical 3D printing. He is one of the initiators of the Miracle Project together with Philip Cutter. He realized this project and he has a huge experience in 3D printing. So I'm really happy to have him here, to have him as my mentor as well because <laughs> we have been knowing each other for more than 20 years now. and. Um, He's, I think, one who can explain uh, what is important in the area of 3D printing in surgery. Yeah, thank you and welcome to Basel. All these people who want to know about more uh, about the robotics and 3D printing. So uh, 3D printing uh, has always to do with uh, individualizing, personalizing a therapy. And I think it's the same with uh, robotics. It's not only automization, it's also a sort of personalization and individualization of, uh, of a therapy. And if you look here, this is in the, in the beginning phase, the model became red because of the, of the light uh, exposure. But uh, here we did a not, not yet a 3D printed plate, it is a plate which was bent to a patient who had a removal of the, max of the mandible and you see it became a bit smaller uh, here in the, in the width because there was also a soft tissue loss here. Mm -hmm. So we did a new uh, individual bent plate here. Today you don't bend it, you print it. Uh? You print it actually, yes. Uh. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, one of the very important and um, very useful examples of 3D printing in maxillofacial surgery. The possibility that we can print directly to the knee, to the anatomy of the patient, perfectly fitting implants made out of titanium, or for example, what you can see here, peak. You have already learned what we are able to do now, nowadays. This is, uh, um, I would say, um, one of the few centers in the world where we are able to print patient-specific implants uh, made out of peak, uh, a filament that will be added layer by layer, and we are able to um, realize geometries that were um, up to now not um, able to be printed or to manufactured by classical milling technologies, for example. What we also implemented, and this is something I saw in some, some videos from more than 20 years ago, uh, we integrated some, let's say, smart um, fixation devices, yeah. those holes in the implant, 
Um, this is something where we are able to reduce uh, material, um, not the plates that we usually use, the titanium plates are, plates are not um, needed anymore. What we also can do is we can integrate, and this is also a feature and makes the implant smart, we can integrate the information where the screw has to direct to and the length of the screw in the implant. So the, the drill will be guided by the implant in the correct position. Of course, a, a robot can do this as well, uh, so yeah. maybe later. But this is something that can be integrated so that we exactly know where the screws need to be placed and how deep they could be inserted. Yeah. But you know, the difference now is that you, the surgeon, are deciding where you want to place a, a screw and which size the screw has and which direction it is. The industry wants to sell as many screws as possible, as possible to yeah. you. Yeah. And now you have the, 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 the chain in your hands uh, uh, and you can decide it and you can print it yourself and I'm for sure in combination with uh, with the laser technology you have now created in the Miracle project you can do in the in the future um, fixation uh, just by a smart cut yeah? exactly. so that you don't need different materials and screws and and plates anymore. This is uh, this is frightening the, the, the industry, the companies. But we have we are here in the OR, uh, and and you have the patient in the center of your focus of, of your view, and and the benefit of the patient. And we have I have visited a patient just uh, 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 some minutes before, and I'm so happy that you make it now possible that MIRACLE, which is a nice acronym, now becomes really a miracle because it changes now the future of surgery. Uh, so, uh, good luck and I hope everybody here in the audience uh, will uh, and should join and make a cooperation with our center because uh, it's not the output of publications, it's not the output uh, um, new companies we want to create. Now we want to create innovation for the patients, for, the, for our society. And, uh, and we are today a global society. You are coming and you are listening from all over the world. So join our global miracle community.